Good afternoon. My name is Marika van der Steenhoven, and I am the Special Collections Education and Outreach Librarian at the Bowdoin College Library, and I want to welcome you all to today's program, Beyond the Reading Room, Archives in the World. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, uh, Candice Soren Wongsrich Analy, who is a member of the Bowdoin class of 2003 and currently serves as the Director of Research at the Massachusetts Historical Society. I mean, um, so great uh, to the Harold and Iris Chandler Lectureship Fund for helping us sponsor this series, um, which is dedicated to explorations of the archive. Um, I'd also like to extend a thanks to Tony Sprague, as always, for helping us um, with the behind the scenes tech part of things. Before I give a, a more full uh, introduction to today's speaker, I want to extend an invitation to all of you to join us for some upcoming programs. On Tuesday, April 13th at noon, um, we are hosting a conversation with marine scientist Spencer Apollonio, who is Bowdoin class of 1955. Um, we are co-presenting this with the Perry McMillan Arctic Museum for a conversation, again, with marine scientist Spencer Apollonio, um, who recently donated um, a section of his uh, field notes, correspondence, and uh, parts of his research to the archives. Um, he'll be in conversation with Arctic Museum curator Genevieve Lemoyne about his work in the North, um, followed by questions from the audience. So we hope you'll join us for that program this coming Tuesday. Uh, our next program in our Audubon page turning series happens on Friday, May 7th at 1230 p.m. Um, again, that is a, an exciting monthly tradition um, where we virtually turn the page of Audubon's double elephant folio Birds of America. And we're going to be joined by lifelong birder and Audubon biographer, Peter Logan, who is also a member of the class of 1975. So those are our two upcoming programs. And I also wanna just put in a quick plug for our community archiving project, documenting Bowdoin and COVID-19. Special Collections and Archives invites Bowdoin students, faculty, staff, and alumni to document your reflections and experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Special Collections and Archives collects and preserves both historical and contemporary records of the college, and through our COVID-19 documentation initiative, we hope to minimize silences in the record by receiving personal reflections from as many Bowdoin community members um, as are willing to share them. Your contribution will balance and bolster the records that the archive is already preserving, including through web and email archiving that document the college administration's actions during this crisis. I will pop the link to um, our website in the chat um, and uh, you can submit an oral history uh, project, a journal, photographs, or complete our kind of low barrier easy access survey. So you can learn more about that as well as our upcoming programs um, via our website. So on to today's program. It is such a delight to welcome Canisord Kid Wongsrich Analy, um, who graduated from Bowdoin in 2003. He received his PhD in history from the University of Virginia. Trained as a Civil War historian, he is the co-editor of So, Conve so Conceived and So Dedicated, Intellectual Life in the Civil War Era, and author of Northern Character, College-Educated New Englanders, Honor, Nationalism, and Leadership in the Civil War Era, both from Fordham University Press. He is currently co-editing a volume titled Wars, Civil and Great, an exploratory and comparative analysis of the American Civil War and World War I. Kidd is Director of Research at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Prior to working at the MHS, he was Associate Professor of History at Angelo State University, where he co-directed the National Endowment for the Humanities Project, War Stories, West Texans and the Experience of War, World War I to the Present. Though I have long known of Kidd um, by way of lasting impressions he left on professors and librarians, as well as his research, which I use regularly in my teaching and to support student research in archives, I only just made Kidd's acquaintance via email when I cold called him, uh, asking whether he'd be interested in participating in this series. He responded with such enthusiasm and kindness. Um, I have truly eagerly been anticipating this program um, ever since. 
In his talk today, Nothing Like Having a Good Repository, the archivist, teacher, counselor, and diversifier of the past, Kidd delivers exactly what I hoped the series would offer, a compelling argument for the power of the archive to help us understand not just our past, but our future. Kid, welcome and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Marika, for that very kind introduction. It is uh, truly an honor to be back, uh, virtually at least, at Bowdoin. Uh, and it's an honor to have been asked to participate in this important series, especially, especially given that my very first experience in an archive was at the George J. Mitchell Special Collections Library at dear old Bowdoin. So the title of my talk today, uh, Nothing Like Having a Good Repository, just real quick, um, is from a quotation uh, from the principal founder of the Massachusetts Historical Society, where I work now, there is nothing like having a good repository and keeping a good lookout, not waiting at home for things to fall into the lap, but prowling about like a wolf for the prey. So a very, very active idea of what an archive should be and do. So let's get started. Uh, it has been a rather long time since I sat at that handsome table looking out at the bay windows as the seasons changed outside of the Mitchell Library there, uh, the reading room at Bowdoin. The path from Bowdoin has taken me to many other archives around the country, and now I work at the, no at the nation's oldest one. So allow me to briefly discuss the history of the MHS before I uh, get going as a way to set the stage for this talk. Founded in 1791, the Massachusetts Historical Society, then simply called the Historical Society because there were no others, was established by individuals who were concerned that no other institution was collecting the stories and documents pertaining to the new nation that revolution and war had just birthed. Since then, the MHS has grown substantially and among its holdings are the papers of two and a half presidents. So that would be John Adams, along with the papers of, uh, and his correspondence with Abigail Adams, John Quincy Adams, their son, representing therefore the second and sixth presidents of the United States, as well as their family members going all the way into the 20th century. What about that half of a presidential library? Well, that would be the papers of, or the personal papers rather, of Thomas Jefferson. Also included are his architectural drawings and whatnot. There are more papers of Thomas Jefferson at the MHS than there are in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We also have documents pertaining to the Pacific trade, remarkable holdings concerning the abolitionist movement and abolitionists. Of particular interest to this group may be the papers of John Albion Andrew, Bowdoin class of 1837, an abolitionist and the Civil War governor of Massachusetts, as well as a great supporter of the forming of African American units during the American Civil War. We also have the papers of leading 19th century historians, 20th century political figures, the papers of various organizations, and many, many more. And although we are primarily a research library with manuscript, manuscripts making up the bulk of our collections, we also hold several historical items of interest as well. Take, for example, a bureau uh, used, uh, supposedly used during the Salem witch trials as a piece of evidence. Someone claiming that a witch either leapt over or came out of one of the drawers of this bureau. We have the epaulets that George Washington wore at Yorktown, the ones he surrendered back to Congress after he uh, resigned his commission at the end of the Revolutionary War. We have the impressing stone for the Liberator, the paper that William Lloyd Garrison edited and published from 1831 to 1865, the end of slavery in the United States. And we have the sword of Robert Gould Shaw, the commander of the 54th Massachusetts, the first African-American regiment raised in the North during the Civil War, and the very sword that Shaw was carrying when he was killed leading his men into battle at Fort Wagner in South Carolina in 1863. From the very start, the mission was very simple for the MHS, 
collect, preserve, and communicate the stories of the American Republic and the American experience. The founders of the MHS believe that the lessons of the past can provide us with context for the present and serve as a guide for the unknown future to come. And one of the historical society's presidents, Thomas Boylston Adams, uh, one of the descendants of the Adams family, distilled the ideas of those founders and recommitted the 20th century MHS to the mission at a ceremony in 1969. Let me quote from him. Here, he reminded his audience, the province of the historian is vast. History is a powerful force in the shaping of human actions. Those who write it have responsibility. That they may discharge their trust honorably depends first of all on the truth of their sources. Only very great libraries of manuscripts and rare books can provide these sources and the means to investigate them. Thus to discover truth out of the past is a means to design an acceptable future. The first action of dictators is always to confiscate, censor, and burn the books. The first action of a free people is to found schools, colleges, and libraries. Of all libraries, the research library is the most important because it preserves the original materials and disseminates to the whole nation the record of the folly as well as the wisdom of the past. The research library is also the least visible, yet the life of the great democracy depends upon it. These seem like simple truths, but it took me a long time to acknowledge just how accurate they are. It took years of exploration and personal experience to realize and understand the truth of this vision. So uh, proclaimed by the founders of the Massachusetts Historical Society at the end of the 18th century and affirmed by its members and caretakers ever since. As people interested in history, none of this should be surprising to you. With the time today, I would like to discuss three projects that I've worked on thus far in my career. I shall use these projects to then illustrate the lessons I learned and argue just how absolutely essential archives are at the start of the third decade of the 21st century. For archives do not just teach us about the past, they teach us about ourselves, about our society, about our civilization, about our fears and weaknesses, about our dreams and our strengths. And they play an essential role in helping us envision a better world. Let me start by discussing how archival collections pose questions to us and force us to think about aspects of the past that we might not have considered. As I mentioned, my first experience with archives was at dear old Bowdoin. Now, I am trained as a 19th century historian and I came to Bowdoin to study or the Civil War. I, was, I went to Bowdoin because of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and I plan to make the Civil War part of the core um, uh, lessons I wanted to take from my time in college. I wanted to study the Civil War. And as a student, I wrote about such Bowdoin graduates in the war as Oliver Otis Howard, uh, William uh, Pitt Fessenden, and Thomas Worcester Hyde. I wrote a column in the Orient and, uh, and had a small booklet published when I graduated as well. But despite my intentions to focus on the Civil War at Bowdoin, my honors project ended up being about an event 80 years after the age of Lincoln. During my sophomore year, you see, one of my history assignments was to interview a veteran and write a paper about their experiences. It was my great honor and privilege to have corresponded with and known Everett Parker Pope of the class of 1941 and a recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor for his services at the Battle of Peleliu in the Pacific Theater during the Second World War. 
Pope very kindly invited me to his home in Florida over spring break of my sophomore year. We spent several days speaking about his experiences and his life. And these recordings are available at the Special Collections Library at Bowdoin if you are interested in listening to them. But I wanted more than just an oral interview to write this paper. And I wanted to see if there was anything from Pope written during the, the Second World War itself in our collections. I was surprised to find that there were boxes and boxes and boxes of correspondences from Bowdoin students and graduates written from places around the world and sent back to the college during this time in American history, during the Second World War sent to the college, sent to whom? To the president and the dean of the college at the time, Kenneth Charles Morton Sills and Paul Nixon. So here was an archive posing a mystery and prompting the question, why? Why on earth would you write back to your college president and dean? Can you imagine yourself doing so today? Would you even know which dean to write to? There are so many of them these days, it's like they just overpopulated in the 1970s. The point is that one is so disconnected from a college's administration these days. Bowdoin, of course, was very different in the 1940s. It was a much smaller place, and the college president and dean knew just everything about students, their siblings, their parents, and their lives. So despite being a 19th century historian, these boxes represented something that one does not find often in research, an unmined and untapped resource. I had to look at them. I had to study them. And I had to make them the centerpiece of my honors project. And I had to answer that question. Why did they exist? And in such volume, too. It took me the rest of my undergraduate time at Bowdoin to make it through all of these boxes and files. And the letters were very personal, moving, and they taught me a great deal about the era as well as the institution. In the historiography of soldiers' motivations, scholars argue that soldiers fought either for patriotism and nationalism, that is their country's cause, or for the comrade next to them, what was known as small group cohesion or small group motivation. But that is not exactly what the, the letters were revealing to me. The letters explained the motivations of these Bowdoin men and elaborated in essence on what the nation meant to these sailors, soldiers, and Marines. The letters fleshed out what it meant to fight for one's nation. For what is a nation but the experience of life as one knows it? The letters had led me to several conclusions. The first of which was that the college meant a great deal to these graduates and students then scattered all around the world. Their descriptions of the campus reveal just how much scenes of peaceful times motivated them in their darkest hours. Take for example, this letter from Robert Coombs of the class of 1940, then serving with the 1st Marine Division in the Pacific Theater. Bowdoin means more to me today than I ever dreamed possible. Many happy memories of college life come to me every day, and life is much more pleasant because of these recollections. When one goes through his four years of college, little does he know how that it will clarify and brighten his life. I guess some of us have to see the light the hard way. Basil Guy of the class of 1947 confessed, I miss the college most of all when I think of such beautiful common scenes as red and gold leaves scattered around the chapel door, snow seen lightly sifting around the campus through the broad bay windows of the alumni room and ferns slowly unfolding on the first warm May day. President Sills received letters from all over the world during the war years, so much so that he remarked, the sun never sets on the sons of Bowdoin. 
For these graduates, college, the college was a way of life. Indeed, the life that they knew before the war, before the entire world changed. And they would give anything to return to it. Here's Robert Allen from the class of 1946 writing, if only we feel there's something to come home to when this is over, we're happy. If I can only return to Bowdoin, I'll be satisfied to fight till this is all over. And one night, Theodore Saba of the class of 1942 noted that he and his comrades began talking, quote, about home and all it had meant, what it would mean again someday, why we were out, how we felt, what we fought for. In attempting to describe the results of this conversation, Saba wrote, quote, it wasn't any of the great or laudatory things that President Sills told us in chapel or any of the high praises that they used in round table discussions. There's a war going on and you're supposed to be fighting for democracy or the four freedoms or something, but I don't know what. Maybe it's worth laying down your life for things intangible, fine and glorious. Yet that is not for me. Rather than the broad and ideological factors, this, this Bowdoin graduate noted that he was fighting for, quote, a lot of little things which don't have any fancy phrases for them. I think what I am fighting for is something like a nickel Coke at the corner drugstore with the sucking noises the straw makes when you go after that last dreg at the bottom. Or maybe it's something like listening sedately with your ears while your body goes all a jumping when Benny Goodman starts to ride. The tender scent of a lovely girl beside you on the sands, her face bathed in the silver of a Florida moon. It's the whip of the pine-filled wind as you cut down the snow-dressed slopes in New Hampshire it's the throaty songs and hearty laughter of half the fraternity house drinking beer at Vic's Silver Bar, or the smell and the roar of the 7th Avenue Express pulling into 14th Street. It's little kids playing hopscotch on the cement walk in front of the Methodist Church and the rapture-filled crowd listening to the Goldman Band concert at Central Park Mall. It's blind dates and cramming for final exams traveling to small towns to play semi-pro basketball and roasting wieners over coals hot as the setting sun. It's jukeboxes, sweaty workers with pay envelopes, Sunday joyriding, boating on the river, and dancing under the stars. These people articulated how it felt to love the college and the archive collected their voices the project taught me the importance of defining what seemed undefined by big and broad ideological terms like nationalism and patriotism, putting that ideology into concrete form. As a Bowdoin student about to graduate, it taught me that the special connection that I felt about the college was far from unique and that there was truly something about this college its people, its places, its history, its aura that had touched so many previous generations of students and graduates. They, in the Second World War, articulated in their words what I felt but could not express about my beloved alma mater. But as one project ended, another began. And this one started with a question from contemporary life and the archives helped provide an answer drawn from the past. I graduated from Bowdoin in May of 2003. Two months before that, I remember watching footage of tanks racing across the sands of Iraq for the second invasion of that country. The invasion was promoted or, or prompted uh, as parted or, or promoted rather as, as part of the war on terror sparked by the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. Around the country, huge demonstrations erupted and a particularly fearful moment, fearful era in modern American life began. In the shadow of 
We had no idea what would happen next. What would become of the world as we knew it? The invasion of Iraq compounded that confusion about who was to blame and what was happening to American society. Having graduated into a world where the United States was at war, I was unsure about what to do. I had been accepted to the graduate program at the University of Virginia, but even as I began my studies, I wondered about my role and what I ought to do. Uncertain about my course, I did what I was trained to do. I looked to history. The questions I had about what I was supposed to do in 2003 and 2004 inspired me to look into the past for an answer. Professor Matt Klingel, hi Matt, was always fond of telling us, and he's probably telling the generations of, of the next generations of Bowdoin students now, research is me-search. And I've always remembered that and is proven correct at nearly every turn in my professional career. So I looked to the past to answer that question, what is a college-educated individual supposed to do in an uncertain world in the midst of a devastating war? And this time, I went back to the 19th century for answers. I examined how New Englanders, college-educated New Englanders, behaved at the start and during the American Civil War. It turns out that they volunteered in large numbers in this, in this fight, in this conflict. And in order to explain this phenomenon, I had to go back to when they were still in school, in the classroom, to see what they were studying and what they were writing about. I returned to the George J. Mitchell Special Collections and Archives to look at letters, diaries, and writings from Bowdoin students who lived through the Civil War era. I visited libraries, historical societies, and university archives around the country. And this was also the first time that I visited the Massachusetts Historical Society. But I also did research at Amherst, at Yale, Williams, Dartmouth, and many other sites as well. And luckily, these archives had preserved in their collections from a century and a half ago what their students at the time thought about their nation and also the reasons their reasons for defending it. And I came away with an understanding of the antebellum college world in which students articulated a specific vision about the United States and their role in it. As the best educated individuals in the Republic, and at the time only about 1% of the American population had a college degree, as the best educated individuals in the Republic, these individuals could do whatever they wanted in the vast untilled fields of 19th century America. They were, be, they were to be the leaders in business, in medicine, in education, in science, and in politics. Thus, when the Civil War threatened their vision of America, and when the times called for leadership, they responded. So briefly, what was their vision of America? What was its future potential in their minds? And college archives provided an answer to those questions. A Harvard student named James Chase rhetorically asked, where then and by whom is the destiny of man on earth to be accomplished? Reason and analogy, the laws of nature and the laws of history, he answered, point to the American continent and the American people. Here on our own soil is growing up the great people of the future. Another Harvard student, William Burridge, pondered a similar question in his essay. What will be the condition of this country in power and territory two or three centuries hence is a question which we often ask of our imagination. His answer, his own vision, was of, quote, a mighty republic extending over the whole North American continent and holding moral sway over the whole world. Burridge claimed that there was, quote, scarcely one who does not cherish in some degree the idea of a future American empire, immense in territory, as well as in political and moral influence. The concept of manifest destiny in his mind was based on, quote, the general idea that this country, as the first 
representative of true Republican principles is to serve as a nucleus around which other republics on this continent will cluster as they may be successful, successively formed. In essence, college students at the time saw America as a power on the, on the rise, spreading across the continent and inspiring the world to follow her democratic example. They truly believed that their young republic represented the fabled city on a hill and that the eyes of humanity were looking upon them. Secession, civil war, and slavery threatened all of this. Student writings found in the archives told me how they viewed the world. The curriculum at the time taught me how they might just apply that knowledge outside of the classroom. One of the last classes that college educated students took before they uh, graduated was the moral philosophy course, usually taught by an institution's president. Here are a couple of images of Bowdoin in the 19th century. The courses were supposed to answer, these moral philosophy courses were supposed to answer the question, as one of the most educated individuals in the nation, how was one supposed to use one's knowledge? In short, the college, the, these final courses taught the students that they had a duty as one of society's most educated members to serve as a leader in a time of crisis. And what a crisis the Civil War represented. Amherst College student Fraser Stearns called upon, quote, everybody particularly the best portion of our community to enlist and come down here. He thought that this was a war that needed to be fought, quote, not only with arms, but to be waged with words. And he suggested that his father, the president of Amherst College at the time, William Stearns, join in the union cause, quote, if all the colleges would organize themselves into brigades, and their presidents go as chaplains and their professors as officers or privates, the effect throughout the South would be electrical. Thousands would spring up to welcome them and some to pray with them on Southern soil. Stearns argued that the sight of the country's quote, educated men going to fight the battles of the Lord would rouse the country quicker to a sense of danger. Another Amherst student, Christopher Pennell, predicted that, that once the early rush of volunteers subsided, there would be, quote, a need of men who shall fight treason from principle and not from the desire for spoils, of educated soldiers who understand what they are fighting for. Tom, Dick, and Harry will not be so ready to enlist then and at that point, he noted the North's most educated men had to fight the war from principle. What is a person worth at such a time if he does not strain every nerve to uphold the stars and stripes, Christopher Pinnell wrote. Both Pinnell and Fraser Stearns were killed in the Civil War. At Harvard, a student by the name of Charles P. Bowditch complained that Northerners seem to be, quote, in a torpor from which nothing can wake them except some terrible disaster, 10 times as severe as that which we have received at the first battle of Bull Run. He thought that, quote, every gentleman and gentleman's son ought to go into the field for such a proceeding would exercise a good influence on everybody. If a company or a regiment of gentlemen should be raised, those in the lower classes would be brought to understand that they too should be willing to sacrifice their lives for the good of the country. A year later, himself clamoring to join, but his parents not letting him volunteer for the war, Bowditch argued that if cultured and educated men enlisted, they would demonstrate the need for all members of society to do so. The example of gentlemen volunteering, he explained, 
would be extremely advantageous. The common people, so far from the war as they are here, cannot perhaps understand the necessities of the occasion simply by newspaper addresses and enthusiastic speeches. But if they saw that the time is so threatening as to require gentlemen to enlist, they would have an example before their eyes, which their senses would lead them to follow. This project, which became my dissertation, taught me about the world of college educated individuals in the moment of the nation's supreme crisis. But it also taught me the importance of serving society with one's knowledge and skill. And in our diverse 21st century society, we have different skills and we serve the nation in different ways. One of my graduate advisors taught me an important lesson that again, struck with me, uh, stuck with me for a long time, that we as historians must write for and engage with the public and not just for other academics. By sharing our knowledge with the general public, that is how we serve society with our knowledge and our skill. What is the use of all our accumulated wisdom of the past if we keep it just for ourselves? And these questions and ideas informed my next major endeavor. I arrived in San Angelo, Texas as an assistant professor of history at Angelo State University in the summer of 2011. San Angelo is four hours west of most of the urban centers in the Lone Star State. It is not connected to any interstate highways. In fact, it is um, right about here in between Highway 10, uh, Interstate 10 and Interstate 20. Uh, and it's primarily sustained by its ranching industry as well as Goodfellow Air Force Base. Sitting on the edge of oil fields, it also draws on a large population of oil field workers. And yet, as far away as San Angelo was from the major cities in Texas, there was still a lot of Texas to the west of it. The state continued for another eight or nine hours to the west into another time zone and to El Paso. The rural nature of this setting is important to the story that I shall return to. Now, Angelo State is part of the Texas Tech University system. It is designated a Hispanic serving institution and a large number of students are first generation college students. I was hired to teach classes in 19th century history as well as the US history survey classes, which all college students in Texas had to take before they graduated. I tried to connect local historical events to the larger narrative in order to get students engaged in the topic and allow them to see that local, state level and regional stories all connected to the national and international stories that we were talking about in class. This exercise was absolutely critical. How can you inspire students to learn about history if they do not see themselves represented in it. For a teenager from Pecos or Lampasas, what did John Adams and Thomas Jefferson have to do with them? What did the Monroe Doctrine matter uh, to them if it was only written by white males and, and white males dominated the historical narrative? History as many understood it was for the wealthy. It was told by the rich it was written for the white and the male. Noticing a large number of veterans in the community and working with the university archive, as well as one of my history department friends, we applied for and received a sizable grant from the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities. In fact, this was the first major NEH grant that Angelo State had ever received. And the grant allowed us to travel to all of these small rural West Texas towns to gather stories about veterans and their loved ones. There was a major collection of Vietnam War oral histories at Texas Tech University, but that was three hours away from us. So many collections that end up in university archives are donated by people who live 
in those communities or have connections to those schools. Now, you remember the, I mentioned the vastness of West Texas. Well, people are not going to travel hours to talk to an archivist or a professor or students. And so this project brought the archive to them. We employed a history harvest approach to collect stories. Basically, we worked with a local organization of public library, a veterans office, uh, churches or little historical societies or groups to advertise our project. We then set up a date and time when we would visit the area and asked that people bring their pictures, their documents and themselves to a designated location where our team interviewed them, scanned the objects that they brought, took pictures of the items that they wanted to share and returned them to them. And there we encountered a similar problem that we were having in the classroom. People simply did not think that they had anything of importance to share. They did not think that their experiences were worthy of inclusion into the historical record. I was there, they would say, but I didn't do, really do anything. We had to convince them otherwise. And by the way, this was not entirely true. There was a gentleman who worked at Angelo State who was a veteran. We tried to interview for years. We kept encouraging him to come in and talk to us. And he said he had nothing to share. His experiences were not important. He shared the stories of his father from the Second World War, but he himself, he said he did nothing, even though he was the body man to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I'm pretty sure he had some stories that we would have been interested in. But you see, this was the very problem that we were trying to rectify. We wanted all people to feel like their experiences mattered that they were part of history, that they were part of the national story that we wanted to tell. And you can see the problem. History is written from archival materials, but if those archival materials do not represent certain groups or populations, then their stories do not make it into the narrative and it creates a sense of exclusion, a vicious cycle of feeling neglected and feeling left out. And our project, War Stories, was a small way to rectify the record. So for four years, we crisscrossed the dusty roads of West Texas, and we had a team of students at Angelo State help transcribe those interviews. Many of the people we interviewed were Hispanic veterans whose stories had never before been recorded. And we created an online memorial to the service of these individuals. Now, Angelo State has updated their website since then. So this is what the old landing page looked like. A visitor to the site can search by conflict, by branch of service, by type of archival material, be pictures or interviews, scan letters. And for the interviews, we also provided transcripts as well as audio recordings when available. Our faculty members also included the project into their classes and got students to interview people in their community to learn about their military service. And some of the items we collected were pictures and diaries, interviews. My project co-director and I now intend to publish some of these interviews uh, as, uh, as a primary source reader for classroom use. Most of the veterans and the loved ones that we interviewed were from the Vietnam generation and their stories illustrate both the terrible cost of the war, as well as the connection that people who have shared an experience of an event larger than themselves have with each other. There are so many stories that we have collected in this project over the years, but I'd like to share just one with you and tell you another story after that. Now, this is part of an interview from someone who interrupted his graduate school career to serve in the Air Force, and he did so because he knew he was about to draft, be, be drafted to go to Vietnam. And here he tells about the end of his ordeal. The story involves an archive, but more than that, the veteran tells us the qualitative experience of what it meant for him to interact with that archive as well. They tell you on the day that you, that you get out, that you have to do serve several things. They give you money and everything. And they tell you it's very important to take your, your discharge. 
they give you a copy of your discharge and they tell you to take it down to wherever you live, to the county registrar and have them make a copy of it and put an official seal on it. They will keep that copy of it and put it, uh, and, and you will retain a copy. And they will keep that copy for as long as you're alive in those county court records. There will always be a copy of it. So if you lose your copy of it, you can always go back there and get a copy from them. So I went back a couple of weeks or a week after I got out, went to the old courthouse building in Santa Clara County in San Jose. And there was, there was a guy next to me. We're both waiting for the, for the registrar or the clerk and it became obvious that we both wanted the same thing, that we both were looking to have our records copy and stamped and given a number and everything. And we didn't talk. We both knew that we had just got out of the, out of the service. Once the clerk finished with us, we both just, we turned and smiled at each other and shook hands, never said a word. We just, but we understood each other. We're out. It's over with. Now we can go on with our lives. The project has yielded many moving memories like that, but perhaps one of the most touching is the following. I can say that I had the rare opportunity an enorm enormously gratifying experience of having the gr granddaughter of one of the veterans I interviewed in one of my classes. I noticed that she was from a town that we had recently visited and shared the same surname as someone that I had personally interviewed. So I asked if she knew anyone by this name. Well, it was her grandfather. And she, she never knew that he was in Vietnam. And not only was he in Vietnam, he was a tunnel rat in Vietnam. This, and she was absolutely stunned to hear this, that her family was part of the national story. She never knew all that he endured in Vietnam and kept bottled inside. And so I wanna emphasize that archives serve a truly important purpose beyond just collecting and helping historians tell stories about the past. They can help us change the narrative that we tell about the past and make it more inclusive, make it more like the nation that we truly are. The archives should reflect the diversity of the population that they serve. And historians can tell stories based on those archives. But historians also have a role to play in making sure that people feel like their stories and histories belong in those archives. We have a role to play in making sure that all Americans feel like they are part of the American story, like they are part of American history and that American history is a part of their heritage. We at the Massachusetts Historical Society are still collecting to this day. We hold nearly 14 million manuscript pieces and, hold, and our holdings grow by about 100 linear feet every year. We are still collecting and we are helping scholars to tell the stories of America and we hope to do so for centuries to come. In fact, this pandemic moment is an important one for archives around the country and the world. Both the MHS and Bowdoin are among the institutions that realize the historic nature of this moment and have asked their community members to donate their recollection, recollections and experiences for posterity. The pandemic has affected every community, every age group, every class, every income level. It has laid bare the clear connections between humans of all walks of life and circumstances. It has shown that we are all human. It has demonstrated how global events have consequences down to the individual level. We are all connected. We all have stories to tell. We are all part of the experience of being. We are all the building blocks of history. We cannot in the words of Abraham Lincoln, we cannot escape history. The best archives help collect, preserve, and communicate these stories of history, our stories, and our history. 
They teach us about the past. They teach us about ourselves. And they help us envision, as well as author, a better future. Thank you for your time. Kid, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation and helping us understand archives in such a nuanced and um, incredible way. So thank you for that. Um, we have about 10 minutes for Q and A's and some questions have come in. If you have questions for Kid, feel free to drop them either in the chat or in the Q and A forum. The first question that came in is from uh, Professor Patrick Rail, um, who asks, Many Bowdoin, <laughs> many Bowdoin students are interested in history, but seem to focus on majors that may seem more viable in a difficult economy. What would you say to students who love studying the past, yet hesitate, oops, sorry, the question moved, yet hesitate to consider careers in the field? Well, there are many ways to engage with history. And this is certainly something that uh, I dealt with as a professor as well. One of our very best students at Angelo State uh, who graduated as a history major uh, told me that uh, he had come in to college initially and was determined to be a biologist or had declared for a biology major. Why? Well, I always liked history, he said, but I didn't wanna be a coach. And you see in Texas, coaches taught history in high school classes. And so that was really what uh, he thought one could do. That's all one could do with a history degree. But the point of the matter is history is a really versatile discipline. It teaches you to research. It teaches you to analyze. It teaches you to think. It teaches you to write. And these are all skills that are absolutely essential in whatever field you pursue. It is certainly something that can be combined with science degrees, with business degrees. It, it teaches, in essence, uh, it creates a well-rounded individual. And that is ultimately what employers want. So make history a, a double major. Make history a minor. Uh, this is really important. Uh, and of course, get involved in local historical group, groups, get involved in, uh, in supporting history education at the state level, at the town level. The more people know about the past, the better. And you can certainly participate in that process, even if you're not directly involved in, uh, in writing about history yourself. Fabulous, thank you. Our next question comes from Chester who asks, what sparked your interest in the US Civil War before your studies at the college? The Killer Angels is a novel. It's a historical novel of the American Civil War of the Battle of Gettysburg. I actually spent most of my life on the other side of the world and I was only introduced to American history in high school. And our um, high school teacher had us read a chapter of The Killer Angels. It was um, the chapter on, the, on Pickett's Charge. And I, 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 I read it and I, I said, where's the rest of this book? It, it made history come alive. I, for most of my education prior to that point, history was uh, just a list of long names, names longer than mine of kings and queens whose actions did not seem to matter to my everyday life. But historical fiction allowed me to imagine myself in the shoes of someone who experienced something much larger than themselves. And it gave me a sense that this was something that one could certainly personalize and learn about. Mm -hmm. And so I always thought that my introduction to history was through historical fiction my policy was always, it didn't matter to me how you became interested in history, if it was a podcast or if it was a movie, a TV show, a, a video game, it didn't matter. As long as it sparked this curiosity, this desire to read more and learn more, I'm all for that. I'm a, a clear product of that. I knew nothing about Joshua Chamberlain, had never heard of Bowdoin College before, would not have been set down this path if these powerful words, this reimagining, this retelling of the past 
had not hooked me while I was in high school. Oh, that's fabulous and very relatable. <laughs> Um, our next question comes from Caroline Mosley, uh, our college archivist, who says, hi, Kim, who great. Me get a lot of those boxes out uh, when I was a student there. <laughs> Uh, Caroline says, hi, kid. Great talk. Thanks. Um, I'm curious about the Civil War resources at the different college archives that you visited. Did you find much the same kinds of sources and attitudes at students um, of students at the different institutions? I, I did. So what I was primarily interested in those college archives were writings from class. Joke being that I couldn't get enough of reading student essays in the present. I had to go back into the past to read them as well, um, but I did. And it really depended on the college. And in fact, it depended on the librarian at the time. Wesleyan University, one of the places I visited had these wonderful collections of student essays from the 1840s. And then I think into the early 1850s, and then it stopped. The collections ended because the librarian at the time, they switched librarians and the new librarian was not collecting those student essays for the archives. Um, and so it really depends on the institution, but many of them, most of them did in fact have these letters, write, writings for uh, debate clubs, societies, or, 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 or for commencement addresses and whatnot. And, um, and they, are, and they were very valuable in helping me to understand not just the college life at the time, but also the worldview of the students at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's wonderful. It makes me think currently um, our digital archivist, Megan, is, is working um, to, to collect more um, records from student groups on campus currently, right? So that we can continue to kind of um, build out those records so that future researchers can have a sense of campus life today. My future uh, self thanks you. Yes, exactly. Uh, we have another question from uh, Professor Rail. Our public culture is fiercely debating the value of public historical commemorations. Statues of Confederate generals are being removed from their pedestals. Schools are being renamed. A pantheon of historical figures are coming under new scrutiny. Could you share your take on these matters as responsible custodians of the past? How should we think about these debates? Well, it is that's a very good question and it's certainly something that's been in the news we have a duty to provide the context and to talk about why these statues were erected in the first place people have noted that these monuments to uh, those who fought for the confederacy for the example went up around the turn of the 20th century at the same time that Jim Crow laws were being solidified, at the same time that lynchings in the United States were skyrocketing, the context matters as to the reasoning behind these, uh, the, the, these cultural movements, right? So our role is to certainly inform as to why they were put up. What people do with it is certainly I would say, uh, something that the society gets to debate, the people who have to see them every day, the people who, uh, who live in the neighborhoods where they were put up, what they want to do with it, if they want to take them down, put them in historical societies, move them someplace else, that's entirely up to them. Our role is to inform. And in informing, of course, we make the case that it's good to know history. It's important to know history. How can you understand the world around you today, the hand you've been dealt, the society you live with, the consequences you endure, mm -hmm. the fate that you have at the, at the moment if you don't understand the past? So true. Um, this is a, a, almost perhaps in the same vein, a question from Alison um, Brow. Speaking as a state governmental attorney with lots of Freedom of Information Act experience, what is your take on the balance of state governmental privacy versus transparency, especially with regard to law enforcement? That is a very good question. Um, uh, well, 
I'm not exactly an archivist, so I don't have the um, official response on that. I do I know that our archives, and Bowdoin too, I'm sure, closes mm -hmm. records for a certain yeah. number of years, 40 years, 50 years, so that what's in them cannot be used at the time for other mm -hmm. proceedings, whatnot. As an historian, of course, I wanna see them. Um, historians are voyeuristic by nature. That's just the nature of the profession. We are nosy and we want to know and understand and see what's in there. But um, I, I think that the archives probably have a good sense of what is in the historical interests um, mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of the movement. Yes, and this is a conversation we have quite often with with students, both in the, the college archives, as well as um, manuscript collections that were given to us by institutions or uh, institutions, organizations or people and those uh, the the concept of restrictions, right, and whether records are in, in um, unavailable for 20 to 75 mm -hmm. years is an ongoing question. But I think Allison's question points to a really a, a future program that we should absolutely uh, put together and in, in considering these things because it is so um, uh, so relevant to so many conversations happening um, um, happening right now. So unfortunately, there are many more wonderful um, questions that unfortunately we want. I want to be cognizant of everyone's time today, um, so we won't get to get them. But what I'm hoping is that someday when we can all gather in person, kid, you'll come up to Bowdoin and we can do another iteration of this and actually be hands on with the archives. Um, I can't express to you enough how much I appreciate you taking the time and putting together such a fabulous presentation. Um, I'm excited uh, that all of you in the audience were able to join us today um, and that also that this recording will live on and um, others who weren't able to join live can can do so um, on the internet. So kid, thank you so much for your time. Uh, again, a thank you to Tony Sprague for helping us um, with the technology aspect of it. Again, to the Harold and Iris Chandler Lectureship Fund for the support to do this Beyond the Reading Room Archives in the World series and to all of you in the audience for joining us today. So um, thank you again, and we hope to see you at future programs. Thank you. Have a great Take day. Take care everyone. and be well. Thank you. Go you bears. <laughs>